Boy, Jano Seekers Restaurant. Yes, I know who be in the Dimba. Number Domoro Kara Jano. Domoro Seneata, Adiata, Topotoro, Fanan Kendama Bigi. Luntan During, Tamala, Abeka Domoro Kijani, Adimanda Wallade, Takawe Vijele, Anim Pananka Fadijan, Ukono Fa. A government of pastry and in bakery, Uko Fanan Bekari. Bad day lomba, conference lomba, workshop lomba, ye four ten nil lomba, dunia kono. Domoro better ma, nil lom international hotel wada, number one. Amanke ba domola jang dama. Esa domo jang, is atari ya. Ah, wamu kubandi. Ah, sa na kubo. Sa futen din. Eh, oto sa na kubo be mu CKS restaurant. Dama na jang na mu yad, ni manje jorom bija. Aban. CKS restaurant, known for best quality food and customer satisfaction. Jodi mi anda hano gerde tenge ngalo sabu ngalo Ibrahim journal tao. Jodi mi anda se ya hai kapiti kinya uloeding. Ha hum pondere ma ku esko no ne waru. Ah wade no awa. Ane kore. Ibrahim mama konto wani. Zero. Action. Times such as this do require. Change mindsets. This is time to take stock to know exactly what our responsibilities should be. Trying times require immense maturity guided by conscience. Science, common sense, reason dictates that uh, we cannot proceed to address any organism phenomenon or thing unless we understand its nature and characteristics. 
we must know what COVID-19 embodies before we can address the challenges it poses. I emphasize understanding an organism, a thing or a phenomenon, because all these could actually create havoc for our existence. Just recently, you've all heard that almost the half of Lebanon was, was destroyed. Why? Because of nitric acid, which we are told had led to explosion causing the devastation that had outraged all human beings of conscience by virtue of the fact that it could have been prevented if there was not neglect. In the same vein, if we neglect COVID-19, we risk the same problem. But the problem will be more devastating because COVID-19 will continue to grow and by its growth will continue to cause death. All of us are fully aware that we started the journey on the 17th of March, 2020. When we were told that a staff of MRC Gambia, a research institution, a renowned research institution, had actually been infected with the illness. That should have been the teacher. If a medical practitioner of one sort or the other, working for a reputable laboratory where disease of all sorts are actually researched on in order to prepare greater understanding of their nature and characteristic and what is to be done to be able to disarm them from being able to harm the human being. If the starting point of the discovery of the invasion of the illness is situated in such an institution, all of us should have been alarmed. And initially, many people were alarmed. At least the government and the Minister of Health saw the need to declare a state of emergency on the 18th of March with the view of mobilizing the nation to be able to face the pandemic in order to prevent it from expanding its invasion of the Gambia. At that moment, there was need for a COVID-19 policy that will drive a strategic plan, that will drive the work plan that should have addressed the incoming invasion. That policy should have had two fundamental approaches a preventive approach and an eradication approach. How do you prevent the illness? How do you eradicate it? So that its prevalence will be extinguished on the face of our soul. Notwithstanding, measures were taken to be able to deal with the situation. We were informed that a national health emergency committee had been created that was expected to take the lead in preparing the ground for the country to address the problem. 
after the declaration of a state of emergency, regulations were put into force. The regulations dealt with open markets. They dealt with closure of non-essential public places. It aimed to deal with restricting transportation and went further to deal with the issue of essential commodities being safeguarded and further on to give rise to looking at the issue of closing the borders. Measures were taken. But we must understand the law in order to understand the measures and why they were necessary or unnecessary. Because this is a time to take stock. The Constitution envisaged that there could be a state of public emergency. On the section 34 of the Constitution, it states very clearly that should there be a state of emergency or the possibility of a state of emergency in that certain situation may exist that may be life-threatening or that a situation exists that is already life-threatening. That under those two conditions, a state of emergency can be declared to indicate that there is a threat to life and existence. One thing that must be understood, which was not understood at the beginning, on the section 34 of the Constitution, all that the president is empowered to do is to declare that a state of emergency exists, a life-threatening situation exists, or that a life-threatening situation may exist if nothing is done to handle an emerging situation. It is a state of alert that is required by the Constitution. And that state of alert was declared. But ultimately, many people misunderstood what Section 34 sought to do. What was a state of emergency? They saw it the possibility of repression of the Gambian population. And if we were to take stock and have a clear understanding of what a state of emergency is, it is important for all Gambians to bear in mind that the state of emergency is nothing more than a declaration of a state of alert. That a situation may continue and develop to be life-threatening, or that a situation exists that is already life-threatening. Full stop. Then what is wrong about the state of emergency? We were told by WHO that a pandemic was sweeping the globe, requiring all countries to take measures either to prevent its entry, its invasion, or to ensure that we fight it, to defeat it once it invades. What is wrong with a country declaring that that pandemic may hit the Gambia and that we should prepare for it. And after we discovered that someone was infected to declare that the pandemic is here and we must take measures to defeat it. It is at that time that the nation should have been summoned to unite as one to be ready to fight a war. But a nation divided is a nation that is weak. And a nation that is weak is a nation that is defeated. So if we are to take stock, we must draw that fundamental lesson that in the face of an enemy, there should be no disunity. There should be unanimity of views in how to handle the problem.
it is important for each Gambian to know what we did right and what we did wrong in order to assess what we should do to be able to do things right. Failing to do things right is suicidal. It is important to see the reason why markets were to be regulated. These are public places where people must go. They call them essential public places. You cannot feed your family without buying goods. What the regulation aimed to do was to ensure that the WHO's recommendations are implemented. And what are those recommendations? WHO discovered that COVID-19 can be transmitted through coughing, through sneezing, through releasing the virus from the mouth and then transfer it to the nostril or mouth or face of another person or surface which can be touched and ultimately transferred internally. So they saw that the preventive strategy is to make that particular recommendation for people to wash their hands so that whatever surface they touch will not lead to the transmission of the illness. Wash your hands. Very simple message. Number two, to maintain safe distance. They call it social distance, but that may not be the right word. Because you can have your phone, I have my phone, that is closely in touch. So there is no social distance there because we are communicating. What it is talking about is safe distancing. Make sure that the distance we maintain is meant for no other purpose but to ensure that each person is safe to fight the illness, to prevent it from spreading. That was the recommendation and is still the recommendation. Added to this is now the face mask. We wait for the health authorities to guide us in what to do to prevent the illness. They also made us to understand that this illness has no cure. It has no cure. But then people are told that somebody has contracted the illness, tested positive, but now the person is healthy again. In the mind of everybody, that means that the person has been cured. And that is why many people felt that what was being said is fairy tale. We did not get the knowledge base of the treatment that those people underwent to be able to get back and restore their health. And that's why knowledge is important. And we don't own that knowledge. We get it transferred to us. The health authorities emphasized to us that every living human being is born with internal capacity to fight illness. We have immunities. And these immunities enable us to fight illness that invade our bodies. When we fight to a point that those immunities become weak, those antibodies become weak, then we become seriously ill. We may vomit, high temperature, may cough. Anything can happen at that stage. And the doctors say those are the symptoms. We are not saying that. We are not doctors. It is the doctors who say that those are the symptoms. And they can look at those symptoms and diagnose, ah, you have malaria. When they diagnose malaria, they can say, go and take quartem. And when you take the quartem, you will discover that the symptoms will begin to disappear until they disappear completely. 
then you are back to your normal self. Then you say, I am cured. That's what curing is all about. The doctor has diagnosed the illness. It has given you the medicine you should take that will fight the parasite in your body and ultimately you get well. But when the doctor tells you that there is no cure, this is not our knowledge, it is their knowledge base, they are saying that if you come to a point where the illness defeats you, defeats your, your immune system, and you start coughing, you start sneezing, uh, sneezing profusely, body temperature high beyond the mark, you become feverish, you cannot carry out anything regarding your daily chores, and you go to them, they are saying that if they diagnose you COVID-19, all they can do for you is to fight the secondary infections. So that in fighting them, they enable you to gain more strength. And when you gain more strength, maybe, maybe your immune system will be restored to a level where it will be able to fight COVID-19 and you get well. That is a maybe. So that is why the doctors say that they cannot diagnose you COVID-19 and say drug A, B, C should be taken and you'll be restored back to health. This is what they have told us. And they emphasize that the illness is highly contagious. We are not saying that. They are the ones saying it. That it develops exponentially by geometrical proportion because of what they said some people are host they are carriers their immune system has helped them to be able to protect them from getting seriously ill they will be ill but not seriously ill to the point of being unable to do their daily chores. So they'll be moving about. And once infected and are not completely treated to get rid of the illness, then they are carriers of the illness. It means that those people are in real terms suicide bombers, in real terms. Because wherever they go, and there are people who are weak in terms of immunity, they will infect those people. And those people ultimately will die from the illness. So they warned us that this is not an ordinary problem. Even if you are healthy, you must be ready to serve your nation by taking part in the preventive strategy. You must understand what the illness can do. And you must understand how you can contribute to it. And you must manage your life in such a way that you do not contribute to its escalation. You will contribute to its eradication. And that is why they have warned us that you are either infected or you are affected. Because others can infect you, and even if you manage to sustain the illness, you can end up also affecting many people, infecting many people, including your wives, your children, your family members, as many people as possible, at infinitum. This is what we are facing. And we are told that as long as the illness is there incubating, it grows in many people. If it grows in 10 people, and 10 people infect each another 10 people, you are talking about 
100 people. If each 100 infect another 10, you are talking about 1,000 people. If each 1,000 infect another 10, 10,000. 10,000, another 10, 100,000. 100,000, another 10, a million. Million, another 10, more than the population of the Gambia. So while the prevalence may appear to be small at the beginning, it can expand with accelerated proportion to decimate a whole nation. That is what we are facing. And that is why everybody must be concerned. What measures did they utilize to prevent? What measures did they utilize to eradicate, to confront and eradicate? Those are the measures that we need to look into. And let me state the law so that you can see how the law must guide our action to deal with the particular problem. The Constitution provides on the section 34 the power to the president to declare a state of emergency. But it wants to restrain the president from abusing power. That is why it says on the section one that the president may declare a state of emergency when a situation exists that can threaten the life of a nation. But then on the subsection two, it gives limits to that declaration that if the National Assembly is in session, then the president makes a declaration. It can only last for seven days, then it lapses. And then, if the National Assembly is not sitting, then it will last for 21 days and it lapses. What happens before the seven days if the National Assembly is sitting, or 21 days if the National Assembly is not sitting? It says on the subsection four that the president can come to the National Assembly and a resolution can be passed by the National Assembly indicating that they can extend what was seven days now to be 90 days, but not more than 90 days. What was 21 days to be 90 days, but not more than 90 days. So the National Assembly is given the power of extension, whilst the President is given the power of proclamation. But it gives both the responsibility. Should you declare a state of emergency, only to discover that the problem is not expanding, then the President can revoke the state of emergency on a subsection three, which means that even if the president declares for, 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 for uh, uh, 21 days, and within six days he discovers that the problem has evaporated, then the president can rely on subsection three to declare, to proclaim that uh, the state of emergency has been revoked. So it's not a permanent state of affair. Then it goes further that the National Assembly has capacity to expand the state of emergency to not more than 90 days. But it can only be done by a vote of two thirds of all the members of the National Assembly. Which means that if more than two thirds do not accept, then it means, if you don't have two-thirds of the National Assembly members, then it means that you cannot continue uh, the expansion. But then, subsection five says that if you expand it 
for one time, and it must be for 90 days or a shorter time that the National Assembly decides. It's all left to the National Assembly. But if they want to increase it again, they could on a subsection five. But this time, the second time, you will require three quarters of the members of the National Assembly, three quarters of the members. So it means that the members of the National Assembly must be united in a vision of fighting a pandemic if they are to extend a state of emergency. But subsection six adds that should the state of emergency lapse and circumstances did not exist for its extension, then there is nothing preventing the president from declaring another state of emergency, which will last no more than seven days if the National Assembly is sitting, and not more than 21 days if the National Assembly is not sitting. So it means that the Constitution does not want to create a gap of any sort, a chasm of any sort. It wants the problem of the nation to be addressed. But my emphasis again, declaration of a state of emergency is simply a state of alert. What should you do once you declare a state of emergency? We are talking about the measures, and it is important for the public to understand the measures. It says on the section 35 of the Constitution that the president is empowered to take measures that are reasonably justifiable in a democratic society to be able to address the challenges that we are facing. But those measures could affect section 19 of the Constitution could affect section 23 of the Constitution, could affect section 25 of the Constitution, should, could affect section 24 of the Constitution, but those are the restrictions, even section 24. It talks about paragraph five and eight. So those ones cannot be touched. So that is what is considered reasonable, that it could affect those sections, but it must affect them in such a way that those rights that you have could only be touched where it is reasonable and justifiable for your own protection or the protection of the nation at large, for the state of good public health, for the state of your personal public health. So this is what is required. So therefore, if the president is empowered to create an act and the National Assembly will have to enact that act. That will provide the measures that could be taken in a state of emergency. Then again, you must move away from the Constitution to create a law. And that's why you have the Emergency Powers Act. It's not created now. It was created since 1965. But a law remains a law as long as it is not repealed. So that act provides under Section 3 that the president can make measures that are reasonably justifiable to deal with any emergency. But that act states that when that happens, when the regulations are made, those regulations must be affirmed by the National Assembly. And if the National Assembly, which is also empowered to be able to revoke a state of emergency on a section 34, subsection 5, the National Assembly also can revoke a state of emergency, which means that a National Assembly can extend a state of emergency for 90 days, and in one month, it revokes it. And when it revokes the state of emergency, the regulations also are revoked. So it is clear that the executive has powers and the National Assembly also has powers. But both would have to work together in unison to address a problem that's a problem, problem for the Gambian population. 
It is therefore important for the citizenry to understand that, yes, a state of emergency was declared. On the 26th, they had to come back again after the lapsing of that state of emergency of, of March. Now to request for an extension from the National Assembly, yes. On the 3rd of April, the National Assembly extended the state of emergency by 45 days instead of meeting the request of 90 days. And then the National Assembly created a committee, a select committee, to accompany the implementation, to study the implementation, and to come back and report to the National Assembly. It is important for you, the media houses, and I'm volunteering to be part of those you will invite as long as we can guarantee greater uh, health security to those who will attend. But to invite all the members of that committee, and I'll be with them. Because there are claims everywhere of what has gone, what has happened in National Assembly. Start inviting the National Assembly members together to debate national issues. This is when you will know who is doing what is right, who is doing what is wrong, who is saying what is right, and who is saying what is wrong. Not somebody who put himself as uh, the, the, the owner of laws and, and knows everything to try to tell you who is right and who is wrong. And in most instances, they are wrong in their conceptualization of, of, of the standing orders or, 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 or the Constitution. You've seen that I said I'm going to the National Assembly to make a difference, and I will not be there after, after this term. I'm not interested in pleasing anybody because I'm not going to stand again to be a National Assembly member. Maybe for another election, but not for National Assembly. So what am I telling you to try to win you so that you can support me or to, 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 to win the dress? And all of you can see the guidance I'm providing in the National Assembly in terms of procedure. That is evident to all of you. So essentially what I am telling you now is precisely the truth that the minister came for an extension of the, Nash, of, of the state of emergency for 45 days. That is just an extension of a state of emergency. Bear that in mind. And ask journalists, you should ask those relevant questions. Whoever wants to speak on the state of emergency, ask them what the state of emergency is. The minister came for an extension of a state of emergency for 45 days. What does that mean? That is to continue to proclaim that a state exists in the country that can threaten the lives of our people. That's all it means. That's what the minister was asking for. To accept that for 45 days, we will accept that a life-threatening situation exists in the Gambia. That's all, full stop, nothing more. And those National Assembly members have authority to give that because that was the reality. COVID-19 is a threat to the existence of the Gambian people. Therefore, any proclamation of a state of alert that it is a threat for 45 days was something that should have been affirmed. And that is what was not affirmed by the three-quarter majority that was needed three-quarter majority that was needed. It was not ever. And the committee that was set up gave a report. The report may have been satisfactory to them, but if you invite them and you invite me, I will show you why the report was not adequate. And why the measures we took to create a select committee was good as a start. But then you have a public finance committee, public accounts committee, finance and public accounts committee. You have a committee on security and defense. You have a committee on trade. You have a committee on health. You have a committee on human rights. You have all these committees in the National Assembly. And when you talk about public finance, the resources that you are going to invest 
to deal with COVID-19, you have to deal with the Finance and Public Accounts Committee. If you talk about the airport, you're talking about public enterprises running that airport. So you'll talk about the public enterprise committee. What do they need to be able to handle the situation at the airport? Health, what do you need in terms of gadgets, in terms of treatment, in terms of resources? Resources both at the level of protection of the frontline workers. What do they need? How much does it cost? What do they need in terms of thermometers to be able to test? What do they need in terms of laboratory? What do they need in expansion of the laboratory to all, 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 all regions? What do they need in terms of quarantine? All these are needs. Where people were quarantined, where the place is healthy for human habitation. That is the responsibility of the health committee, uh, stand, uh, select committee on health, to look at. So all the committees in the national people were asked to close down non-essential services. How will they earn an income? The Committee on Trade would have been very much interested in quantifying and knowing the lost. We talk about nutrition. Health would have been important there. So in essence, in our standing orders, we needed joint committees. After the first instance of a select committee that will gather the information, we needed now joint committees to be able to deal with the problem. So those who knew the trajectory of what the National Assembly ought to do guided the National Assembly properly so that ultimately we will listen to what the minister had to say in terms of his request for extension. Then if we wish, we could cut it down, uh, negotiate with the minister, cut it down to 30 days, just like we did with the 90 days. But in actual fact, what is the relevance? Why not 45 days? Because that was the reality, that a state of emergency existed. So you should have been more concerned with the regulations rather than the declaration of a state of emergency. So anybody with, with real knowledge of what Section 34 entailed would not have mind any number of days being declared. Why? Because COVID-19 was a threat to our existence and remained a threat to our existence and would have remained a threat for 90 days. So that's what we should have told our population, that it was a threat to our existence. And now, the next phase is, what measures were we to take? That's where the committees would have been relevant. From the base information we received from our first committee, we then move into concrete monitoring. And what would have been done if we went into concrete monitoring is precisely where I will come to my conclusion. Fundamentally, they spoke about open markets being restricted.